Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. We now continue with part two of The Mysteries of Udolpho, volume two, chapter three. Reading and musical selections performed by Kara Dahl Russell. Emily wrote on the opposite page of the paper as follows. It is now useless, sir, for me to remonstrate upon the circumstances of which Signor Montoni informs me that he has written. I could have wished, at least, that the affair had been concluded with less precipitation, and that I might have taught myself to subdue some prejudices, as the Signor calls them, which still linger in my heart. As it is, I submit. In point of prudence, nothing certainly can be objected, but though I submit, I have yet much to say on some other points of the subject, when I shall have the honor of seeing you. In the meantime, I entreat you to take care of Teresa, for the sake of, sir, your affectionate niece, Emily Saint-Aubert. Montoni smiled satirically at what Emily had written, but did not object to it. And when she withdrew to her own apartment, where she sat down to begin a letter to Valancourt, in which she related the particulars of her journey and her arrival at Venice, described some of the most striking scenes in the passage over the Alps, her emotions on her first view of Italy, the manners and characters of the people around her, and some few circumstances of Montoni's conduct. But she avoided even naming Count Morano, much more the declaration he had made, since she well knew how tremblingly alive to fear is real love, how jealously watchful of every circumstance that it may affect its interest, how jealously watchful of every circumstance that may affect its interest, and she scrupulously avoided to give Valancourt even the slightest reason for believing he had a rival. On the following day, Count Morano dined again at Montoni's. He was in an uncommon flow of spirits, and Emily thought there was somewhat of exultation in his manner of addressing her which she had never observed before. She endeavored to repress this by more than her usual reserve, but the cold civility of her air now seemed rather to encourage than to depress him. He appeared watchful of an opportunity of speaking with her alone, and more than once solicited this, but Emily always replied that she could hear nothing from him which he would be unwilling to repeat before the whole company. In the evening, Madame Montoni and her party went out upon the sea, and as the Count led Emily to his Zendaletto, he carried her hand to his lips and thanked her for the condescension she had shown him. Emily, in extreme surprise and displeasure, hastily withdrew her hand, and concluded that he had spoken ironically, but, on reaching the steps of the terrace, and observing by the livery that it was the Count's Zandaletto which awaited below, while the rest of the party, having arranged themselves in the gondolas, were moving on, she determined not to permit a separate conversation, and, wishing him a good evening, returned to the portico. The Count followed to expostulate and entreat, and Montoni, who then came out, rendered solicitation unnecessary, for, without condescending to speak, he took her hand and led her into the Zendaletto. Emily was not silent. She entreated Montoni in a low voice to consider the impropriety of these circumstances, and that he would spare her the mortification of submitting to them. He, however, was inflexible. "'This caprice is intolerable,' said he, "'and shall not be indulged. There is no impropriety in the case.'
At this moment, Emily's dislike of Count Morano rose to abhorrence. That he should, with undaunted assurance, thus pursue her, notwithstanding all she had expressed on the subject of his address, and think, as it was evident he did, that her opinion of him was of no consequence, so long as his pretensions were sanctioned by Montoni, added indignation to the disgust which she had felt towards him. She was somewhat relieved by observing that Montoni was to be of the party, who seated himself on one side of her, while Morano placed himself on the other. There was a pause for some moments as the gondolieri prepared their oars, and Emily trembled from apprehension of the discourse that might follow this silence. At length she collected courage enough to break it, in the hope of preventing fine speeches from Morano and reproof from Montoni. To some trivial remark which she made, the latter returned a short and disobliging reply, but Morano immediately followed with a general observation, which he contrived to end with a particular compliment, and though Emily passed it without even the notice of a smile, he was not discouraged. I have been impatient, said he, addressing Emily, to express my gratitude, to thank you for your goodness, that I must also thank Signor Montoni, who has allowed me this opportunity of doing so. Emily regarded the Count with a look of mingled astonishment and displeasure. Why, continued he, should you wish to diminish the delight of this moment with that air of cruel reserve? Why seek to throw me again into perplexities of doubt by teaching your eyes to contradict the kindness of your late declaration? You cannot doubt the sincerity, the ardor of my passion. It is therefore unnecessary, charming Emily, surely unnecessary any longer to attempt a disguise of your sentiments. If I had ever disguised them, sir, said Emily, with a recollected spirit, it would certainly be unnecessary any longer to do so. I had hoped, sir, that you would have spared me any further necessity of alluding to them. But since you do not grant this, hear me declare for the last time that your perseverance has deprived you even of the esteem which I was inclined to believe you merited. Astonishing! exclaimed Montoni. This is beyond my expectation, though I have hitherto done justice to the caprice of the sex. But you will observe, Madame Emily, that I am no lover, nor Count Morano is, and that I will not be made the amusement of your capricious moments. Here is the offer of an alliance which should do honor to any family. Yours, you will recollect, is not noble. You long resisted my remonstrances, but my honor is now engaged, and it shall not be trifled with. You shall adhere to the declaration which you have made me an agent to convey to the Count. I must certainly mistake you, sir, said Emily. My answers on the subject have been uniform. It is unworthy of you to accuse me of caprice. If you have condescended to be my agent, it is an honor I did not solicit. I myself have constantly assured Count Morano, and you also, sir, that I never can accept the honor he offers me, and I now repeat the declaration. The Count looked with an air of surprise and inquiry at Montoni, whose countenance was also marked with surprise, but it was a surprise mingled with indignation. Here is confidence as well as caprice, said the latter. Will you deny your own words, madame? Such a question is unworthy of an answer, sir, said Emily, blushing. You will recollect yourself, and be sorry that you have asked it. Speak to the point, rejoined Montoni, in a voice of increasing vehemence. Will you deny your own words? Will you deny that you acknowledged, only a few hours ago, that it was too late to recede from your engagements, that you accepted the Count's hand? I will deny all this for no words of mine ever imported it. Astonishing! Will you deny what you wrote to Monsieur Quesnel, your uncle? 
If you do, your own hand will bear testimony against you. What have you now to say? continued Montoni, observing the silence and confusion of Emily. Oh, I now perceive, sir, that you are under a very great error, and that I have been equally mistaken. No more duplicity, I entreat. Be open and candid, if it is possible. I have always been so, sir, and I can claim no merit in such conduct, for I have nothing to conceal. How is this, signor? cried Marano, with trembling emotion. Suspend your judgment, count, replied Montoni. The wiles of a female heart unsearchable. Now, madame, your explanation. Excuse me, sir, if I withhold my explanation till you appear willing to give me your confidence. Assertion as present can only submit me to insult. Your explanation, I entreat you, said Morano. Well, well, rejoined Montoni, I give you my confidence. Let us hear this explanation. Let me lead to it, then, by asking a question. As many as you please, said Montoni contemptuously. What, then, was the subject of your letter to Monsieur Casnel? The same that was the subject of your note to him, certainly. You did well to stipulate for my confidence before you demanded that question. I must beg you will be more explicit, sir. What was that subject? What could it be but the noble offer from Count Morano, said Montoni. Then, sir, we entirely misunderstood each other. We entirely misunderstood each other, too, I suppose, in the conversation which preceded the writing of that note. I must do you the justice to own that you are very ingenious at the same art of misunderstanding. Emily tried to restrain the tears that came to her eyes and to answer with becoming firmness. Allow me, sir, to explain myself fully or to be wholly silent. The explanation may now be dispensed with. It is anticipated. If Count Morano still thinks one necessary, I will give him an honest one. You have changed your intention since our last conversation. And if he can have patience and humility enough to wait until tomorrow, he will probably find it changed again. But as I have neither the patience nor the humility which you expect from a lover, I warn you of the effect of my displeasure. Montoni, you are too precipitate, said the Count, who had listened to the conversation in extreme agitation and impatience. Signora, I entreat your own explanation of this affair. Signor Montoni has said justly, replied Emily, that all explanation may now be dispensed with after what has passed. I cannot suffer myself to give one. It is sufficient for me and for you, sir, that I repeat my late declaration. Let me hope this is the last time it will be necessary for me to repeat it. I never can accept the honor of your alliance. Charming Emily, exclaimed the Count in an impassioned tone, let not resentment make you unjust. Let me not suffer for the offense of Montoni. Revoke offense, interrupted Montoni. Count, this language is ridiculous. This submission is childish. Speak as becomes a man, not as the slave of a petty tyrant. You distract me, signor. Suffer me to plead my own case. You have already proved insufficient to it. All conversation on this subject, sir, said Emily, is worse than useless, since it can bring only pain to each of us. If you would oblige me, pursue it no further. It is impossible, madam, that I can easily resign the object of a passion which is the delight and torment of my life. I must still love, still pursue you with unremitting ardour when you shall be convinced of the strength and consistency of my passion your heart will soften into pity and repentance is this generous sir is this manly can it either deserve or obtain the esteem you solicit thus to continue a persecution from which i have no present means of escaping 
a gleam of moonlight that fell upon Morano's countenance, revealed the strong emotions of his soul, and, glancing on Montoni, discovered the dark resentment which contrasted his features. "'By heaven, this is too much!' suddenly exclaimed the Count. "'Signor Montoni, you treat me ill. It is from you that I shall look for explanation.' "'From me, sir! You shall have it!' muttered Montoni. "'If your discernment is indeed so far obscured by passion as to make explanation necessary, and for you, madam, you should learn that a man of honour is not to be trifled with, though you may perhaps with impunity treat a boy like a puppet.' This sarcasm roused the pride of Morano, and the resentment which he had felt at the indifference of Emily being lost in indignation at the insolence of Montoni, he determined to mortify him by defending her. This also, said he, replying to Montoni's last words, this also shall not pass unnoticed. I did bid you, sir, that you have a stronger enemy than a woman to contend with. I will protect Signora Saint Aubert from your threatened resentment. You have misled me, and I would revenge your disappointed views upon the innocent. Misled you? retorted Montoni with quickness. It is my conduct, my word. Then pausing, while he seemed endeavouring to restrain the resentment that flashed in his eyes, in the next moment he added in a subdued voice, Count Morano. This is a language, a sort of conduct, to which I am not accustomed. It is the conduct of a passionate boy. As such, I will pass it over in contempt. In contempt, signor? The respect I owe myself, rejoined Montoni, requires that I should converse more largely with you upon some points of the subject in dispute. Return with me to Venice, and I will condescend to convince you of your error. Condescend, sir, but I will not condescend to be so conversed with. Montoni smiled contemptuously, and Emily, now terrified for the consequences of what she saw and heard, could no longer be silent. She explained the whole subject upon which she had mistaken Montoni in the morning, declaring that she understood him to have consulted her solely concerning the disposal of La Vallée, and concluding with entreating that he would write immediately to Monsieur Cansnell to rectify the mistake. But Montoni either was, or affected to be, still incredulous, and Count Morano was still entangled in perplexity. While she was speaking, however, the attention of her auditors had been diverted from the immediate occasion of their resentment, and their passion consequently became less. Montoni desired the Count would order his servants to row back to Venice, that he might have some private conversation with him, and Morano, somewhat soothed by his softened voice and manner, and eager to examine into the full extent of his difficulties, complied. Emily, comforted by this prospect of release, employed the present moments in endeavouring, with conciliatory care, to prevent any fatal mischief between the persons who had so lately persecuted and insulted her. Her spirits revived when she once more heard the voice of song and laughter resounding from the Grand Canal, and at length entered again between its stately piazzas. The Zendaletto stopped at Montoni's mansion, and the Count hastily led her into the hall, where Montoni took his arm and said something in a low voice, on which Morano kissed the hand he held, notwithstanding Emily's effort to disengage it, and wishing her a good evening, with an accent and a look she could not misunderstand, returned to his Zendaletto with Montoni. Emily, in her own apartment, considered with intense anxiety all the unjust and tyrannical conduct of Montoni, the dauntless perseverance of Morano, and her own desolate situation, removed from her friends and country. She looked in vain to Valancourt, confined by his profession to a distant kingdom as her protector, but it gave her comfort to know that there was, at least, one person in the world 
who would sympathize in her afflictions, and whose wishes would fly eagerly to release her. Yet she determined not to give him unavailing pain by relating the reason she had to regret the having rejected his better judgment concerning Montoni, reasons, however, which could not induce her to lament the delicacy and disinterested affection that had made her reject his proposal for a clandestine marriage. The approaching interview with her uncle she regarded with some degree of hope, for she determined to represent to him the distress of her situation and to entreat that he would allow her to return to France with him and Madame Casnel. Then, suddenly remembering that her beloved La Vallée, her only home, was no longer at her command, her tears flowed anew, and she feared that she had little pity to expect from a man who, like Monsieur Casnel, could dispose of it without deigning to consult with her, and could dismiss an aged and faithful servant, destitute of either support or asylum. But though it was certain that she herself no longer had a home in France, and few, very few friends there, she determined to return, if possible, that she might be released from the power of Montoni, whose particularly oppressive conduct towards herself and general character as to others were justly terrible to her imagination. She had no wish to reside with her uncle, Monsieur Casnel, since his behavior to her late father and to herself had been uniformly such as to convince her that, that in flying to him she could only obtain an exchange of oppressors. Neither had she the slightest intention of consenting to the proposal of Valancourt for an immediate marriage, though this would give her a lawful and generous protector for the chief reasons which had formerly influenced her conduct still existed against it, while others which seemed to justify the step would not be done away. And his interest, his fame, were at all times too dear to her to suffer her to consent to a union which, at this early period of their lives, would probably defeat both. One sure and one proper asylum, however, would still be open to her in France. She knew that she could board in the convent where she had formerly experienced so much kindness, and which had an affecting and solemn claim upon her heart, since it contained the remains of her late father. Here she could remain in safety and tranquillity till the term, for which La Vallée might be let, should expire, or till the arrangement of Monsieur Motteville's affairs enabled her so far to estimate the remains of her fortune, as to judge whether it would be prudent for her to reside there. Concerning Montoni's conduct with respect to his letters to Monsieur Casnel, she had many doubts. However he might be at first mistaken on the subject, she much suspected that he willfully preserved in his error as a means of intimidating her into compliance with his wishes of uniting her to Count Morano. Whether this was or was not the fact, she was extremely anxious to explain the affair to Monsieur Casnel, and looked forward with a mixture of impatience, hope, and fear to their approaching visit. On the following day, Madame Montoni, being left alone with Emily, introduced the mention of Count Morano by expressing her surprise that she had not joined the party on the water the preceding evening, and at her abrupt departure to Venice. Emily then related what had passed, expressed her concern for the mutual mistake that had occurred between Montoni and herself, and solicited her aunt's kind offices in urging him to give a decisive denial to the Count's further addresses. But she soon perceived that Madame Montoni had not been ignorant of the late conversation when she introduced the present. "'You have no encouragement to expect from me,' said her aunt, "'in these notions.' I have already given my opinion on the subject, and I think, Signor Montoni, right in enforcing, by any means, your consent. If young persons will be blind to their interest and obstinately oppose it, why, the greatest blessings they can have are friends who will oppose their folly. Pray, 
What pretensions of any kind do you think you have to such a match as is now offered you? Not any whatever, madam, replied Emily, and therefore at least suffer me to be happy in my humility. Nay, niece, it cannot be denied that you have pride enough. My poor brother, your father, had his share of pride too, though let me add, his fortune did not justify it. Emily, somewhat embarrassed by the indignation which this malevolent allusion to her father excited, and by the difficulty of rendering her answer as temperate as it should be reprehensive, hesitated for some moments in a confusion which highly gratified her aunt. At length she said, "'My father's pride, madam, had a noble object. The happiness which he knew could be derived only from goodness, knowledge, and charity.' As it never consisted in his superiority in point of fortune to some persons, it was not humbled by his inferiority in that respect to others. He never disdained those who were wretched by poverty and misfortune. He did sometimes despise persons who, with many opportunities of happiness, rendered themselves miserable by vanity, ignorance, and cruelty. I shall think it my highest glory to emulate such pride. Oh, I do not pretend to understand anything of these high-flown sentiments, niece. You have all that glory to yourself. I would teach you a little plain sense, and not have you so wise as to despise happiness. That would indeed not be wisdom, but folly, said Emily, for wisdom can boast no higher attainment than happiness. But you will allow, madam, that our ideas of happiness may differ. I cannot doubt that you wish me happy, but I must fear you are mistaken in the means of making me so. Oh, I cannot boast of a learned education, niece, such as your father thought proper to give you, and therefore I do not pretend to understand all these fine speeches about happiness. I must be contented to understand only common sense, and happy would it have been for you and your father if that had been included in his education. Emily was too much shocked by these reflections on her father's memory to despise this speech as it deserved. Madame Montoni was about to speak, but Emily quitted the room and retired to her own, where the little spirit she had lately exerted yielded to grief and vexation and left her only to her tears. From every review of her situation she could derive, indeed, only new sorrow. To the discovery which had just been forced upon her of Montoni's unworthiness, she had now to add that of the cruel vanity for the gratification of which her aunt was about to sacrifice her, of the effrontery and cunning with which at the time that she meditated the sacrifice, she boasted of her tenderness, or insulted her victim, and of the venomous envy which, as it did not scruple to attack her father's character, could scarcely be expected to withhold from her own. During the few days that intervened between this conversation and the departure for Miranetti, Montoni did not once address himself to Emily. His looks sufficiently declared his resentment. But that he should forbear to renew a mention of the subject of it exceedingly surprised her, who was no less astonished that, during three days, Count Murano neither visited Montoni nor was named by him. Several conjectures arose in her mind. Sometimes she feared that the dispute between them had been revived and had ended fatally for the Count. Sometimes she was inclined to hope that 
weariness or disgust at her firm rejection of his suit had induced him to relinquish it, and at others she suspected that he had now recourse to stratagem and forbore his visits and prevailed with Montoni to forbear the repetition of his name in the expectation that gratitude and generosity would prevail with her to give him the consent which he could not hope from love. Thus passed the time in vain conjecture and alternate hopes and fears, till the day arrived when Montoni was to set out for the Via of Mirenti, which, like the preceding ones, neither brought the count nor the mention of him. Montoni, having determined not to leave Venice till towards evening, that he might avoid the heats and catch the cool breezes of the night, embarked about an hour before sunset, with his family, in a barge for the Brenta. Emily sat alone near the stern of the vessel, and as it floated slowly on, watched the gay and lofty city lessening from her view, till its palaces seemed to sink in the distant waves, while its loftier towers and domes, illuminated by the declining sun, appeared on the horizon, like those far-seen clouds which, in more northern climes, often linger on the western verge and catch the last light of the summer's evening. Soon after, even these grew dim and faded in distance from her sight, but she still sat gazing on the vast scene of cloudless sky and mighty waters, and listening in pleasing awe to the deep-sounding waves while as her eyes glanced over the Adriatic towards the opposite shores, which were, however, far beyond the reach of sight, she thought of Greece, and, a thousand classical remembrances stealing to her mind, she experienced that pensive luxury which is felt on viewing the scenes of ancient story and on comparing their present state of silence and solitude with that of their former grandeur and animation. The scenes of the Iliad elapsed in glowing colors to her fancy, scenes once the haunt of heroes now lonely and in ruins, but which still shone in the poet's strain in all their youthful splendor. As her imagination painted with melancholy touches the deserted plains of Troy, such as they appeared in this after day, she reanimated the landscape with the following little story. Stanzas Quote, O'er Ilion's plains, where once the warrior bled and once the poet raised his deathless strain, O'er Ilion's plains a weary driver led his stately camels for the ruined fane. Wide round the lonely scene his glance he threw, for now the red cloud faded in the west, and twilight o'er the silent landscape drew her deepening veil. Eastward his course he pressed. There, on the gray horizon's glimmering bound, rose the proud columns of deserted Troy, and wandering shepherds now a shelter found within those walls where princes want to joy. Beneath the lofty porch the driver passed, then from his camels heaved the heavy load, partook with them the simple cool repast, and in short vesper gave himself to God. From distant lands with merchandise he came, his all of wealth his patient servants bore, oft deep-drawn sighs his anxious wish proclaimed to reach again his happy cottage door. For there his wife, his little children dwell. Their smiles shall pay the toil of many an hour. Even now warm tears to expectation swell as fancy o'er his mind extends her power. A death-like stillness reigned, where once the song, the song of heroes, waked the midnight air, save 
when a solemn murmur rolled along that seemed to say, For future worlds prepare. For time's imperious voice was frequent heard shaking the marble temple to its fall. By hands he long had conquered vainly reared, and distant ruins answered to his call. While Hamet slept, his camels round him lay, beneath him all his store of wealth was piled, and here his cruise and empty wallet lay, and there the flute that cheered him in the wild. The robber tartar on his slumber stole, for o'er the waste at eve he watched his train. Ah, who his thirst of plunder shall control? Who calls on him for mercy calls in vain? A poisoned poignard in his belt he wore, a crescent sword depended at his side, the deathful quiver at his back he bore, and infants at his very look had died. The moon's cold beam athwart the temple fell, and to his sleeping prey the tartar led, but soft. A startled camel shook his bell, then stretched his limbs, and reared his drowsy head. Hamet awoke, the poignard glittered high, swift from his couch he sprung and scraped the blow, when from an unknown hand the arrows fly that lay the ruffian in his vengeance low. He groaned, he died, from forth a column gate, a fearful shepherd, pale and silent, crept, who, as he watched his folded flock starlate, had marked the robber steal where Hamet slept. He feared his own, and saved a stranger's life. Poor Hamet clasped him to his grateful heart, then roused his camels for the dusty strife, and, with the shepherd, hastened to depart. And now... Aurora breathes her freshening gale, and faintly trembles on the eastern cloud. And now the sun from under twilight's veil looks gaily forth and melts her airy shroud. Wide o'er the level plains, his slanting beams dart their long lines on Ilion's tower side. The distant Hellespont with morning gleams, And old Scamander wins his waves in light. All merry sound the camel bells so gay, And merry beats fond Hamet's heart, For he, ere the dim evening steals upon the day, His children, wife, and happy home shall see. End quote. As Emily approached the shores of Italy, she began to discriminate the rich features and varied coloring of the landscape. The purple hills, groves of orange, pine, and cypress, shading magnificent villas, and towns rising among the vineyards and plantations. The noble Brenta, pouring its broad waves into the sea, now appeared, and, when she reached its mouth, the barge stopped that the horses might be fastened which were now to tow it up the stream. 
This done, Emily gave a last look to the Adriatic and to the dim sail, quote, that from the sky-mixed wave dawns on the sight, end quote, and the barge slowly glided between the green and luxuriant slopes of the river. The grandeur of the Palladian villas that adorn these shores was considerably heightened by the setting rays, which threw strong contrasts of light and shade upon the porticos and long arches, and beamed a mellow luster upon the orangeries and the tall groves of pine and cypress that overhung the buildings. The scent of oranges, of flowering myrtles, and other odiferous plants was diffused upon the air, and often, from these embowered retreats, a strain of music stole on the calm, and, quote, softened into silence, end quote. The sun now sunk below the horizon. Twilight fell over the landscape, and Emily, wrapped in musing silence, continued to watch its features gradually vanishing into obscurity. She remembered her many happy evenings when, with Saint-Aubert, she had observed the shades of twilight steal over a scene as beautiful as this from the gardens of La Vallée, and a tear fell to the memory of her father. Her spirits were softened into melancholy by the influence of the hour, by the low murmur of the wave passing under the vessel, and the stillness of the air that trembled only at intervals with distant music. Why else should she, at these moments, have looked on her attachment to Valancourt with presages so very afflicting, since she had but lately received letters from him that had soothed for a while all her anxieties. It now seemed to her oppressed mind that she had taken leave of him for ever, and that the countries which separated them would never more be retraced by her. She looked upon Count Morano with horror, as in some degree the cause of this. But apart from him, a conviction, if such that may be called, which arises from no proof, and which she knew not to account for, seized her mind, that she should never see Valancourt again. Though she knew that neither Morano's solicitations nor Montoni's commands had lawful power to enforce her obedience, she regarded both with a superstitious dread that they would finally prevail. <laughs> Lost in this melancholy reverie and shedding frequent tears, Emily was at length roused by Montoni, and she followed him to the cabin, where refreshments were spread, and her aunt was seated alone. The countenance of Madame Montoni was inflamed with resentment that appeared to be the consequence of some conversation she had had with her husband, who regarded her with a kind of sullen disdain, and both preserved, for some time, a haughty silence. Montoni then spoke to Emily of Monsieur Casnel. You will not, I hope, persist in disclaiming your knowledge of the subject of my letter to him. I had hoped, sir, that it was no longer necessary for me to disclaim it, said Emily. I had hoped, from your silence, that you were convinced of your error. You have hoped in possibilities, then, replied Montoni. 
I might, as reasonably, have expected uh, to find sincerity and uniformity of conduct in one of your sex, as you to convict me of error in this affair. Emily blushed and was silent. She now perceived too clearly that she had hoped an impossibility, for where no mistake had been committed, no conviction could follow, and it was evident that Montoni's conduct had not been the consequence of mistake, but of design. Anxious to escape from conversation, which was both afflicting and humiliating to her, she soon returned to the deck and resumed her station near the stern without apprehension of cold, for no vapor rose from the water and the air was dry and tranquil. Here, at least... The benevolence of nature allowed her the quiet which Montoni had denied her elsewhere. It was now past midnight. The stars shed a kind of twilight that served to show the dark outline of the shores on either hand and the gray surface of the river till the moon rose from behind a high palm grove and shed her mellow luster over the scene. The vessel glided smoothly on. Amid the stillness of the hour, Emily heard now and then the solitary voice of the bargemen on the bank as they spoke to their horses, while, from a remote part of the vessel, with melancholy song, quote, the sailors soothed beneath the trembling moon the midnight wave, end quote. Emily, meanwhile, anticipated her reception by Messieurs and Madame Quesnel, considered what she would say on the subject of La Vallée, and then, to withhold her mind from more anxious topics, tried to amuse herself by discriminating the faint-drawn features of the landscape reposing in the moonlight. While her fancy thus wandered, she saw at a distance a building peeping between the moonlight trees and, as the barge approached, heard voices speaking and soon distinguished the lofty portico of a villa overshadowed by groves of pine and sycamore which she recollected to be the same that had formerly been pointed out to her as belonging to Madame Quesnel's relative. The barge stopped at a flight of marble steps, which led up the bank to a lawn. Lights appeared between some pillars beyond the portico. Montoni sent forward his servant and then disembarked with his family. They found Monsieur and Madame Quesnel, with a few friends, seated on sofas in the portico enjoying the cool breeze of the night and eating fruits and ices while some of their servants at a little distance on the river's bank were performing a simple serenade. Emily was now accustomed to the way of living in this warm country and was not surprised to find Monsieur and Madame Quesnel in their portico two hours after midnight. The usual salutations being over, the company seated themselves in the portico, and refreshments were brought them from the adjoining hall, where a banquet was spread and servants attended. When the bustle of this meeting had subsided, and Emily had recovered from the little flutter into which it had thrown her spirits, she was struck with the singular beauty of the hall, so perfectly accommodated to the luxuries of the season. It was of white marble, and the roof, rising into an open cupola, was supported by columns of the same material. Two opposite sides of the apartment, terminating in open porticos, admitted to the hall a full view of the gardens and of the river scenery. In the center, a fountain continually refreshed the air and seemed to heighten the fragrance that breathed from the surrounding orangeries, while its dashing waters 
gave an agreeable and soothing sound. Etruscan lamps, suspended from the pillars, diffused a brilliant light over the interior part of the hall, leaving the remoter porticos to the softer luster of the moon. Monsieur Quesnel talked apart to Montoni of his own affairs, in his usual strain of self-importance, boasted of his new acquisitions, and then affected to pity some disappointments which Montoni had lately sustained. Meanwhile, the latter, whose pride at least enabled him to despise such vanity as this, and whose discernment at once detected under this assumed pity the frivolous malignity of Quesnel's mind, listened to him in contemptuous silence, till he named his niece, and then they left the portico and walked away into the gardens. Emily, however, still attended to Madame Casnel, who spoke of France, for even the name of her native country was dear to her, and she found some pleasure in looking at a person who had lately been in it. That country, too, was inhabited by Valancourt, and she listened to the mention of it with a faint hope that he also would be named. Madame Casnel, who, when she was in France, had talked with rapture of Italy, now that she was in Italy, talked with equal praise of France, and endeavored to excite the wonder and envy of her auditors by accounts of palaces which they had not been happy enough to see. In these descriptions she not only imposed upon them, but upon herself, for she never thought a present pleasure equal to one that had passed. And thus the delicious climate, the fragrant orangeries, and all the luxuries which surrounded her slept unnoticed, while her fancy wandered over the distant scenes of a northern country. Emily listened in vain for the name of Valancourt, Madame Montoni spoke in her turn of the delights of Venice, and of the pleasures she expected from visiting the fine castle of Montoni on the Apennine, which latter mention, at least, was merely a retaliating boast, for Emily well knew that her aunt had no taste for solitary grandeur, and particularly for such as the castle of Udolpho promised. Thus the party continued to converse, and as far as civility would permit, to torture each other by mutual boasts, while they reclined on sofas in the portico, and were environed with delights both from nature and art, by which any honest minds would have been tempered to benevolence, and happy imaginations would have been soothed to enchantment. The dawn, soon after, trembling in the eastern horizon, and the light tints of morning gradually expanding, showed the beautifully declining forms of the Italian mountains and the gleaming landscapes stretched at their feet. Then the sunbeams, shooting up from behind the hills, spread over the scene that fine saffron tinge, which seems to impart repose to all it touches. The landscape no longer gleamed. All its glowing colors were revealed, except for the remoter features were still softened and united in the mist of distance, whose sweet effect was heightened to Emily by the dark verdure of the pines and cypresses that overarched the foreground of the river. The market people, passing with their boats to Venice, now formed a moving picture on the Brenta, most of these had little painted awnings to shelter their owners from the sunbeams, which, together with the piles of fruit and flowers displayed beneath, and the tasteful simplicity of the peasant girls who watched the rural treasures, rendered them gay and striking objects. The swift movement of the boats down the current, the quick glance of oars in the water, and now and then the passing chorus of peasants who reclined under the sail of their little bark, or the tones of some rustic instrument, played by a girl as she sat near her sylvan cargo, 
heightened the animation and festivity of the scene. When Montoni and Monsieur Casnel had joined the ladies, the party left the portico for the gardens, where the charming scenery soon withdrew Emily's thoughts from painful subjects. The majestic forms and rich verdure of cypresses she had never seen so perfect before. Groves of cedar, lemon, and orange, the spiry clusters of pine and poplar, the luxuriant chestnut and oriental plain threw all their pomp of shade over these gardens, while bowers of flowering myrtle and other spicy shrubs mingled their fragrance with that of flowers whose vivid and various coloring glowed with increased effect beneath the contrasted umbrage of the groves. The air also was continually refreshed by rivulets, which, with more taste than passion, had been suffered to wander among the green recesses. Emily often lingered behind the party to contemplate the distant landscape that closed a vista or that gleamed beneath the dark foliage of the foreground. The spiral summits of the mountains touched with a purple tint, broken and steep above, but shelving gradually to their base. The open valley, marked by no formal lines of art, and the tall groves of cypress, pine, and poplar, sometimes embellished by a ruined villa, whose broken columns appeared between the branches of a pine, that seemed to droop over their fall. From other parts of the gardens, the character of the view was entirely changed, and the fine, solitary beauty of the landscape shifted for the crowded features and varied coloring of inhabitation. The sun was now gaining fast upon the sky, and the party quitted the gardens and retired to repose. End of Volume 2, Chapter 3 Reading and musical selections performed by Kara Dahl Russell